Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Please I listen to this whence you can safely close your eyes because throughout this let me bore you to sleep recording at some point you may be bored to sleep right I'm sitting in my garden shed in my bedroom which is a sentence you won't hear very many places not places that you can leave without permission probably but I do have a shed in my bedroom a garden shed it's going to be my recording studio in fact it is my recording studio already but I am going to I'm going to do more to soundproof it but you know what it definitely has taken the edge off of background sounds because it doesn't really need to be completely silent does it I prefer it for myself I suppose in some ways it does you know it makes sense, especially while it's a sleep session. You don't really want a drum set in the background. But at the same time, I know I don't know, I quite like doing these recordings in the living room. <laughs> I don't know why really it's maybe it's having Andre there uh, it's quite nice but then he does play up it could be particularly naughty sometimes but uh, yeah I tell you it's a weird one because it's half past seven or maybe eight o'clock in the morning and I've just got out of bed. I made a, I made a sleep hypnosis weekly recording at half seven because I was overdue by about ten days to make those uh, to make one. So I'm going to be recording a new one every Monday and releasing it every Monday. That's my new thing. And. with that podcast I do need as minimum background sounds as possible and I think the only real background sound during that particular recording was my tummy rumbling it was it was I don't know how to explain it do you know I don't know if you've ever been into a bakery, like a big bakery, or any bakery really, they have those big metal bowls where the dough goes in and they have the the twirling thing that goes round and round that mixes, it's called a mixer isn't it, that mix the dough. But it didn't really sound like that, I don't know what, I can't think what it did sound like. So I used to work in a bakery. I've worked in two, 
three if you include one evening cleaning the bakery but I actually had a jobs at two different bakeries um, and when I worked for the biggest one like this is I'm not saying it's the biggest bakery in the world but it was massive huge 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 place and they were baking you know they were sending out lorries and lorries loads of lorries load of bread every day so they were busy 24 hour operation and um, I think they were delivering to all over the country as well not just London where it was based and basically everything was bigger so they had those metal bowls with the mixer but it was well it wasn't the size of a house but It wasn't far off. You, you basically need a crane to carry it. You, well, you couldn't carry it. You'd need... To... Sometimes... The thing broke. And it... When it was when it finished mixing... And then all the dough was there... It would... It'd have to pull a lever to release it. But instead of... Um, tip in one way it tipped the other way and it would fall on the floor and it was like the blob it was it was big you could walk into it and hide it was that big this big blob of dough Yeah, I do recall one day breaking about a million eggs and I was excited because I'd learnt to break eggs when um, I worked at the co-op and uh, I used to get them out of storage and put them on the shelves and Broke most of them when I did that. Put them in people's bags, carry bags, broke them doing that. Very good at breaking eggs. But I learned how to break eggs properly, like, you know, into bowls for bread or cakes or whatever the eggs are being used for. When I worked in a bakery and when I was a teenager, I used to work in the bakehouse. It was called and I learned how to break one egg in each hand at the same time could have said simultaneously no at the same time without getting any shell in and I loved that skill one of the I think I entered the work world at the age of 15 with very few skills. I'm guessing a lot of people do, actually. Um, but a lot of people don't as well. A lot of people might do. A lot of people won't. So yeah, I don't know. I, but so I thought that was a good skill to have. Now, when I worked in the chip shop when I was 15 to 17, I worked there for two years, I used to break eggs. I'm pretty sure, did I used to, when did I used to break eggs? Did the eggs have, do we have eggs for batter? Or is it, it might not be, I think, is it batter just 
milk and um, not talcum powder, flour, that's it. Is it just milk and flour? Or is it eggs as well? I forget. I wonder if there was any eggs involved in that job. Or oh, we had pickled eggs in a jar. But I wasn't responsible for those. And I wonder if they were made in the shop or if they were just... I think they were and just put into vinegar. I can't remember. But then I went to catering college during that period as well. And I was ever so cocky when it came to breaking eggs. I kept saying, you know what? I can break two eggs at the same time. Or well, someone always said, do you mean simultaneously? I said, no, at the same time. And my teacher would practically always say something silly, so some kind of put down, like, we're studying health and safety at the moment, Jason. The egg story isn't really relevant. At the same time. I always had the last word. Even if it didn't make sense. But the thing is, when I did break some eggs at the catering college when I was... I was learning to be a chef. It, it was kind of pointless, the whole thing. I'm not, not being a chef, but I was on the YTS scheme, which was called the Youth Training Scheme, which gave employers an opportunity to take advantage of young people and get them to work for practically nothing. Uh, so that was a really good thing for employers and really good for young people if they were learning a trade you know like becoming a bricklayer or plumber or electrician and, you know I mean it, if they were learning something useful where they would get paid a decent wage afterwards so it was kind of like a an apprenticeship that was what it was based upon the things that my dad's generation had when they left school they could go and become an apprentice and learn a trade carpenter boiler not boiler 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 made no boiler heating fit you know a boiler fixer heating engineer that's it and a heating engineer lollipop man no but you know I, I did wonder how how do lollipop men and ladies learn their trade Because it takes a lot of confidence, doesn't it, just to stand in front of the traffic, dressed so ridiculously, and then holding up a stick in the shape of a lollipop. And it, it, I don't know, just I wonder where they learn. Maybe it's some kind of mantra forget how I'm dressed forget that I'm holding a lollipop I demand respect might, might, maybe that's a mantra they say inside their head so I, I was on the YTS and I think it was every Tuesday 
might have been every Wednesday, I forget. I think it was just one day a week I went to college and it was in the next town. And it started in September. And I was there all day and we had to learn no, health and safety, first aid, all that stuff. And cooking. Plus, and I don't know why, and it doesn't make sense to me, I learned about waiting as well. I learned how to be a waiter. That's probably something that may surprise those that have been listening for a while. I learned how to properly be a waiter like proper you know um, the kind of thing that you'd see in a top restaurant I was trained to that level I can't remember the first thing about it um, in fact I don't think I even turned up no I did turn up for the exam I remember actually at the the waiting part of the exam because I had friends that were also at college some of them also doing um, the chef course so my friend Dean he was actually he wasn't doing the waiting I don't think he was just doing the chef but he was doing it um I think he was there full time, so his his course was um, to become a chef. Mine was more probably the first part of becoming a chef. I don't know. I forget, but all I know is I had to go. During my exam, the practical exam for waiting. I was so lucky because I was all dressed up like a, a waiter and the table that I was given was a table full of my friends who made my life hell for that hour, wound me up, messed me about they even complained about me they just did everything they could to cause problems for me and I think I ended up shouting at them and uh, I think someone said to uh, one of my friends I was complaining about how the duck looked on the plate I think I said in so many words you're going to make love to it or eat it and apparently that's frowned upon it's not great etiquette apparently I'm not sure if I threw any food over anybody but that is the kind of thing that I would have done back then you know put the soup down on the table in such a way that it, part of it falls over the edge onto their lap that hot soup you know, there's, there's different ways of getting your revenge <laughs> when you're a waiter and when I was waiting I'll tell you how good I was at a waiting that the chip shop I had or that I worked at had a restaurant <clears throat> I was never allowed to wait on the tables so he preferred, he prepared, preferred to have school girls come in and work part time or and there was an old lady that used to come in as well and serve at lunch times rather than have me who was being trained to be a professional waiter <laughs> that's quite funny really isn't it you think about it 
but those skills did come in handy a little bit because in later life I did do a bit of waiting but not I uh, just a little bit of table service you know with various different jobs I had but nothing like a like, proper restaurant because I'd find myself because we used to practice every single week I think or every other week I think one week would be the waiting staff and the next week would be in the kitchen cooking and we would be serving the the real customers that came into the college so you know if I'd be in the kitchen cooking the food for them or I'd be waiting for the food to hand it out to them and I'm not sure which one I dislike most I think cooking the food you get to have a little nibble now and then if you're cooking something nice but it's quite hot waiting almost a bit like having a spotlight on you and you're walking around like being on stage and there's someone just following you with a spotlight like go away I'm just trying to m mix in and do something else go away look at something else depending on what mood I was in sometimes I didn't turn up but Faulty Towers did or Basil Faulty and I'd start being rude to people <laughs> I just like it it's almost like Basil Faulty took over my body and someone would say something like uh, yeah the uh, this fish is a bit cold Okay then, right, I'll take it back to the kitchen roll and I'll just, you know, march off. And that wasn't a very good impression, but... I enjoyed myself. Never really... I really saw the point of waiters not at the point of them but in the sense of just give me my food you know when it's ready just I always say thank you and everything but when the food's cooked either I'll wait at the counter for the cook to food to be cooked or if you bring it to the table bring it to the table but don't turn it into some kind of big dramatic scene it's just food on a plate you've walked from there to here you didn't put the food on the plate yourself that was done by the cooks or the chefs or the server whoever does it you didn't wash the plate that was done by the kitchen porter you didn't cook the food that was done by the chefs and the was it petty chefs I don't know whatever they're called you didn't grow the vegetables that was the farmer you didn't deliver the vegetables that was the that might have been the farmer as well I don't know the, del the delivery driver so basically you just carried the food from there to here And I'm grateful because it saved me a walk. But I won't be writing a song about it. You know, it's not. I've done waiting, and the hardest part is the people, the awkward people taking the food out to the table 
it's just carrying food on a plate or a tray and just putting it on a table from a certain side you need to put it on from the right side or from the left side I know it was one side or the other I remember someone said to me once a customer I was said you know you just served me from the wrong side I said do you think it's going to make any difference to the taste of the food never say that during an exam but yes I like to have the food delivered but I don't you know tipping never really been a tipper we don't have a tipping culture in England try to try to introduce it I tried I really try but generally it's not it's not really important to the general public maybe to in like nice restaurants I haven't been in many nice restaurants I really am a bit of a caveman but I think it's a I think it's worth remembering that maybe if someone goes to a really nice restaurant with their partner for example they may have been saving up for that for a few weeks and that meal may cost 180 pounds which is a week's wages for example and when you just spent a week's wages on something that you're going to poo out in a few hours I don't know I don't personally want to pay anything extra here's a tip thanks for I don't know how to say this but thanks for doing your job <laughs> thanks for carrying the plates which is why I think they should get paid more because that's the thing it's, 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 just, it's just as important well it's not is it it's not as important as the person cooking the food you know they're, they're the most important people really just for the fact that you want the food to be cooked but this, why, why is I think it should be a nicely paid job to be a, a waiter just put the pri price of the food up I'm no expert but I've worked in a few restaurants um, worked in clubs worked in places where there was food being served and I know it can be a really hard job so I don't know why I'm making out that I'm ignorant to it because it's very very tough at times I've known a lot of waiting staff and seen what they've had to do and the mix up with the food and getting the bill paid and different people ordering different things from the same table and then saying they didn't order it and drinks being ordered from one person on that table and the bill comes up and then they say oh, I never ordered that <laughs> so yeah it's uh, it's quite a but it's the same thing isn't it it's very it's repeating what you've already done generally and I suppose that's like a lot of jobs I mean if you're a, a maths professor you've kind of learnt it haven't you you've learned how to work stuff out and 
or if you're a history professor, a history teacher, generally history doesn't change. And we do get new information and um, unlike probably the rest of the population, we don't, you know, I don't know if a history teacher would update their knowledge base. I know that the general way of dealing with facts that conflict with our knowledge is to ignore the facts and to still believe the old stuff, which is uh, a bit ridiculous really, isn't it, you think about it. Wow. Wow. And I went to this, went to this uh, catering thing. I had to get up early in the morning because I had to be there for nine o'clock. And I think I started my job normally at nine. So I had to get up extra early because it was at least an hour. It was about 45 minutes on the bus and then a walk from the bus station to the college and a walk to the bus stop from where I lived. Not a long walk to be fair, it's across the road. So, I'd be on the bus with people that I knew, so I had friends that would be on that bus. So we would mess around a bit. And again, we were still teenagers. I was the youngest, um, but I was 16 by the time I went to college. So I was 15 when I started the chip shop job in April 1986. But by September, I just turned 16. So when I went to college, I was 16. And what I remember about it is, because I've been to that college twice, once since, I went in 2003 where I did a holistic therapy course. But now the college is gone and it's now been replaced by a university. So I'm not sure if they knocked down the old building, but they built a lot of stuff around there. And it's this this basically is well it's not it is a university now but that all happened it started to be done while I was living in that town but then I moved away it's a bit like Stratford when I moved away from Stratford before I moved they were they'd already re, they'd replaced the they replaced the bus station and made it all fancy and had these big kind of umbrella type things in the air and I didn't know why I really didn't know why I kind of wanted to but I didn't know who to ask it was lovely it was really really nicely designed and they probably spent a lot of money doing it. Spent quite a long time doing it as well. And it's just near the train station. And then they they started working on the underground while I was still in London. I spent a few years doing that. And they built first of all they built the the Docklands railway but that was that was not I mean I used to travel on the Docklands railway in 1996 when I was a security guard because I had a job in Canary Wharf and the Docklands railway took me from Stratford to Canary Wharf and 
the thing was, if I'm correct, there was no driver. It was just operated automatically. And there was a, like a ticket inspector just pressed a button and it just went and stopped. It's a really weird train. But quite nice because it was quite glassy. So you could see, not classy as in me, but glassy as in something that's got a lot of windowy, windowy, that's probably a better word. And you could see both sides of the train and you could see it being built up. And that whole area, it's a massive hidden area of waste ground massive area because I used to walk through there and it's a shortcut to the train station from where I used to work and it would take about 20 minutes to walk through it big old area and I did think to myself because there used to be all these old trains and train tracks just rotting away there and I used to think why don't they do something with this area a massive area and it's wildlife there as well little bunny rabbits running around and it's quiet which you don't get a lot of in, in London just to have a little quiet space so it would have been nice if they turned it into a park or something it would have been a lovely bit of park <laughs> a lovely bit of park and over the years, I think from probably when I first moved to Stratford, going to the train station, the tube, or the over there's an overground and a tube there at the time. So it's basically two trains. There was the overground and there was a the tube. That was it. And now there's, they built the Docklands and extended that and made that so that, and they were building Canary Wharf at the same time. So that all got built up whilst I was living there. And again, that was just waste ground, parts of the Docklands it used to be docks and then it used to be busy busy docks so I worked with a lot of people that were my well they were, you know they were probably in their 50s and they had spent most of their adult life working on the docks but then it closed down and for whatever reason I mean in Stratford I saw an old picture of Stratford, which is where I lived. There used to be trams there. There used to be trams going through. It was a busy area. It was, you know, with all the docks, dot the, and you know, there was a lot of people working in that area. It looked like quite a nice place, actually. Mind you, those old black and white pictures, they do look quite nice, don't they? They're almost snowy. You know, snowy. You know when you see a, a snowy picture with snow? Snow's usually needed for it to be snowy. It just looks nice. It might be really smelly, but it just looks nice on the photograph. And in Stratford, the tube station entrance, it was grimy. It was. There was two entrances. You could get there through the supermarket or the shopping centre, which was... It was all right. I, I didn't know anything different. So that was... Uh, it was quite, I mean, it wasn't big, but it was very packed, very, you know, you'd be practically stuck to someone's back as you was walking through, very busy. 
pickpockets and uh, wet dream basically is I never pickpocketed even no matter how romantic it came across in uh, Oliver Twist never did it and the that supermarket that um, shopping centre was there the whole time pretty much that I was there but did start to change what was in there as you walk in as you walk down from um yeah because that that led you go all the way through this uh, shopping center and there were some steps that went down at the end and that led to a tunnel which walked down which then led to the entrance to the tube station and you just walk through you know it carried on it was no it's not it's an entrance but not really it just continued and you go in there on the left hand side there was a ticket offices on the right hand side there was machines I think they were red but you could purchase your tickets on the machines now as you walk down that tunnel towards the entrance to the tube station on the right there was some steps or it might have just been a a slope I forget and that was the entrance that I usually used because it was I used to take a shortcut then that led down the entrance but if you wanted to you could turn left before going into the entrance of the, sh of the tube station and that lead to a, a car park behind a little car park where the taxis would be and you could order a taxi and it would turn up and sometimes there'd be taxis already waiting and it was uh, it was very hit and miss you know so I spent many times there at one o'clock in the morning sitting there waiting for a taxi or just sitting down for a rest on a Friday evening or Friday, Saturday morning, Friday morning, Sunday morning, two o'clock. Yeah. The amount of times I got the last bus, or the last train rather, to, I'm sure the last train was about half twelve or one o'clock at the weekends, Stratford. It was a central line. I used to need to get and then you'd go in through Stratford Station. If you you might already have your ticket. There was no ticket um barriers or anything like that. I just walk straight through and then there was basically you could turn left and there's some steps or you could keep walking across and then there were some other steps and it was basically you were either side of the platform if that makes sense so it depended which direction you wanted to go so if you take the first left as you walk through go up the steps on the left hand side was the tubes the underground and then on the right hand side there was the overground train which that train would go to Liverpool Street if you wanted to go to South End you'd have to walk up to the other platform and that would take you to South End or if you wanted to go to um, yeah I think if I remember rightly, the one on the left, the tube went to the direction towards um, Ealing, I think. I think Ealing was the last stop, and it would go via Mile End, uh, 
Bank, Liverpool Street, Oxford Street, Oxford Circus, uh, Tottenham Court Road, Holborn, all you know, the various different um, stops. But the other direction, pretty sure Grange Hill and Rice Slip maybe was like near the end of the tube, the of the uh, central line. So when I came back, I'd be getting off of that platform and then walking down the steps. See, I don't think they had slopes. So I don't think wheel, people in wheelchairs had... Well, there were people in wheelchairs back then because it was just all steps. Ah, that's weird, isn't it? I wonder if there was a, a lift... I just don't remember. There must have been. There might have been a lift, I really don't recall. And so that was what it was like. Then they started to transform the tube station and make it nice make it groovy and this started in the late 90s and it was it was kind of a dodgy place to be sometimes but then they started to make it nice and groovy and they Yeah, they built a whole new platform, platforms, and a whole new connection from another line. I don't know if it was the Piccadilly line, uh, I'm not sure, but it just, and I don't know where the space came from, because suddenly there was this huge area with different trains mm. going from different places. And I had no idea where they where did they come from. But what's quite well, it's, no, it's funny. But if you go through Stratford, let's say if you're going to Liverpool Street from, um, I'm guessing pretty much anywhere on the Overground, you go through Stratford because that's the first, that is the last stop before Liverpool Street. And if you look, if you just look at the platform and the trains, and once you go past, you might it might stop, might keep going depending if if it has to stop or not. And you see people waiting for a train for the tube. The tube pulls up. That's the same image that you would have got in nineteen ninety one. The only difference is the trains are a bit newer. The people are probably different because it's what 29 years ago 28 years ago but it doesn't look any different really but then if you look up you see this big um, shopping centre and as you come into Stratford I don't know if it's as you come in or as you leave Stratford but you see the the stadium, you know, the Olympic Stadium that's now the, I don't know what it is, it's now, the, I think it's West Ham Football Ground now, and they transformed that whole area, just that area, it was... And that happened when I left. So between 2001 and 2012, they, it's not totally true, they had started doing a few bits, but the main thing they'd started doing was they, they started a train, an underground, like a new connection, 
I thought that they were going to connect the Euro Tunnel to Stratford, which they may have done, I don't know. But they, there was people working on that from definitely in 2001 because a cafe opened specifically just for them. And I lived around the corner and I used to have a sausage sandwich on the way to work. So, and that was busy. There was a lot of people working there. So, the whole area, I don't know how many billions of pounds they had put into that. Getting that area built, offices, just huge, you know, everything. And they transformed that area just around the train station and the bus station but there's still stuff that's still there that's old that, that was there when I moved there like an old decrepit buildings just still there surrounded by these new um, fangled angle buildings sparkly barclays And it's just, I, mean, I think there's at least two hotels that sprouted up in Stratford, just not far from the train station. I think there's a Holiday Inn and another one. I don't know what it is. I stayed in the Holiday Inn. And it's kind of strange because it's this big lovely building inside it's really nice big reception and there's a bar and everything's you know it's just really um, everything's new it's not new but you know everything looks good and then you look out your window and it's Stratford it's it there's this one place I stayed and there was a school downstairs like it was overlooking the school and people playing football which I, I kind of wouldn't expect from a hotel room I'm not a snob well, I am but I'm just a very poor snob <laughs> and It's kind of weird how you've got these places. And as you walk away back towards where I used to live, you get to Mile End. There's another train station, not Mile End. Uh, oh, it went out of my head there. Not Mile End. Wow, the train station's gone out of my head. But it was a... It was a train station, but it was, it's between Forest Gate and Stratford. And it just was never busy. It was just never busy. And every time I've gone past there on a train coming to Liverpool Street, it's I've never seen more than about three people waiting for a train. Forest Gate, that's it, Forest Gate. Not Forest Gate, I already said Forest Gate. My, Maryland. Maryland? I think it's Maryland, I think that's the name of the station, Maryland. And then you turn left and walk down towards Leighton, which is Stratford, but you know towards where I used to live go down that way and there's a few buildings put up but the closer you get to where I used to live the more it starts to look exactly the same because they can put buildings up but they can't 
can't, they don't do anything about the houses. Not that the houses need anything doing to them, but I've travelled through through Forest Gate, between Forest Gate and Stratford, towards Liverpool Street. I've done that journey hundreds of times since the late 80s. And the houses that the train overlooks as you go past, there's a group of houses and they have always looked the same. And as you drive, as the train goes into Liverpool Street, it's messy. There's graffiti everywhere. It's the same old, like, little dungeon that it always was. They made Liverpool Street Station look lovely, but they did nothing for the entrance to Liverpool Street as you travel inwards. Just a little paint job would have been nice. I think that they might not know that people can see it. Maybe they think that no, actually, I like it to stay the way it is. I think it's nice to have, it's nice to have that familiarity, isn't it? Some things just, oh, I want some things to stay the same. I don't want everything to change. That's why Stratford, occasionally, not very often, but occasionally I'll go and I'll have a little look. I'll go for a little wander around my old haunting patches, revisit some of the places that I used to live. I can't do all of them in one day. And I just walk down the street and it's the same exactly the same as it was 20 years ago 30 years ago I quite like that yeah I do I quite like it it doesn't excite me but I do quite like it I don't, I don't think I'm going to write a book about it, but I do, I like the feeling of, maybe it is nostalgia. But in some ways it makes the memories seem a bit more real. If I remember walking down there, turning left, and there was a an off license on the left, and Across the road there was a laundrette and there was a post box. Wow, I can't remember believe, remembering this. There was a post box outside the laundrette and there was a zebra crossing. And next to the laundrette there was two pizza places. There was Domino's or it might have been Pizza Hut, I can't remember. But I remember the other one, it was called Pizza Go Go. And they were cheap. And I loved them. And I used to... I'd, I'd have like one pizza a week. I've never really been a... Never like been a regular, kind of every night of the week kind of person to eat. Never had the money really to do that. But I'd treat myself. But they were cheap. They were nearly half the price of the Pizza Hut. And... On the corner there was... A uh, news agents, and it was ram packed full of stuff. Seriously, there was so much stuff in there, and there was so much stuff that it was hard to have more than one customer in the shop at a time because of the amount of stuff that was in there that you could buy. 
I got on really well with the with the owner, the man that was there. He was fairly old, elderly, really, at that time. Must have been in his sixties, if not older. And he was quite rude, which I liked, and quite grumpy, which I also liked. But kind of got to know him, and we chatted and stuff, and I'd go in every day buy a newspaper and whatever and I had this new girlfriend in 1996 and she was visiting me at my home in Stratford and on the way out I think walk going to the train station we needed to get something so we went into that news agent's I think he said hello Jason he, I don't know if, if he ever knew my name and uh, just asked what we wanted I don't know what we were getting a can of coke or something and he said wait a second and he put from under the counter he pulled out a dirty mag dirty magazine full of naked people he put it on the counter he said do you, want to, do you want to take this now or do you want to take it later? <laughs> now my girlfriend was standing right next to me. He did it to embarrass me. It's very funny, but out of order. And I never bought dirty magazines from that shop. It's like, well, maybe sometimes, I don't know. I can't remember everything I did, but... It's like, what? Literally, with this new girlfriend that's only starting to get to know me, go into a news agent, a news agent who knows me clearly, says that my my episode of Biggins is in. Did I want to take? Did I want to take it home with me now? Yeah, I'll, I'll read it now. Yeah, I suppose I can borrow your bathroom. Can I? In fact, you just hold it open and I'll, you know. So, yeah. It's, uh, that was a weird one, that was. He was a funny man, though. So, on that note, I'm going to go and uh, upload this. So, please remember to be kind to yourself. Because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love.